This week on The Communicators, a discussion on major issues before the Federal Communications Commission with Commissioner Jonathan Adelstein. He discussed content on television, how the FCC conducts its business, and potential changes at the Commission after the November presidential election. Well, we are pleased to welcome to The Communicators this week Jonathan Adelstein, one of two Democratic commissioners on the Federal Communications Commission. He's here to talk about several issues before the FCC today. Thank you, Mr. Adelstein, for being with us. Well, thanks for having me, Peter. Well, if we could start with a little tea leaf reading. It's an election year. Uh, if a Democratic administration is elected, if Barack Obama wins, how do you think that the FCC will look, and what, so, what are some of the issues did you think the focus will be on? I think there's a real need for a focus on a national broadband policy. The United States is falling behind a lot of other countries around the world. And this is critical to our economic growth. And I think that uh, there's a lot more discussion about this than there ever has been. A lot of elaboration of that in some of the platforms that we're seeing, uh, in particular by uh, Senator Obama, to really transform the way that we look at broadband in America. It's fundamental to so many things. It's fundamental to our economic growth our ability to keep jobs in this country and not outsource them overseas, why shouldn't we insource jobs into rural America by making sure that rural parts of the country have every bit as much bandwidth as any other part of America? See, broadband in itself isn't one of the big topics of the campaign, but it's one that feeds into all of the subtopics that we're hearing about in the election. If it's health care, broadband can enable doctors to do work from anywhere, to read radiological charts, to get information, it can lower health care costs, it can improve health care quality, particularly for rural areas where there aren't specialists. They can, through broadband connections, have access to remote locations. Think about education. Tele telemedicine is one thing, but education is also being transformed by broadband. Not only can our kids get access to a wealth of information, but they also can uh, do work from a distance. They can have uh, classes that are beamed into their homes from distant locations. It can uh, transform education. Even energy in the environment, the big issues that we're talking about. If you can get broadband pipes, people can telecommute and then they won't have to uh, spend as much on energy and ruin the environment in the process. All these things require fat broadband pipes and I think that there's going to be a real discussion about the need for a national broadband policy to make that happen. Direct federal funding? Well, that's a part of it. I think it's a broad approach across different government agencies. Part of it is direct federal funding. Right now we're spending four billion dollars a year through the FCC's Universal Service Program to finance voice telephony. But these days it's increasingly becoming just one application over broadband pipes. So rather than focusing on just one application, I think the government's going to increasingly focus on broadband, the underlying transmission, having fat broadband pipes and making sure that rural areas have every bit as much bandwidth as any other part of the country. Well, uh, Commissioner Adelstein, uh, how does that play into the uh, proposed auction and the M2Z proposal to uh, provide free broadband? Well, getting broadband requires a national broadband policy that involves an array of different approaches across government agencies. I mean, I talked about universal service. It also involves spectrum. I think wireless is the real key to broadband competition. Right now we have two sources that most Americans get their broadband from, their cable provider and their telephone provider. Now, what we need in a competitive world is a third option. I call it a third channel under the home because I think it'll be over wireless uh, transmission. We're looking right now at the FCC at different types of spectrum we can identify for competitive purposes. One of the ideas before us right now is to spec auction off some spectrum and uh, a certain band that would allow for two-way broadband and there's been one proposal to allow a nat nationwide free broadband service that would be financed through ads but there's other areas that we can get more spectrum for example the government is sitting on a lot of spectrum it doesn't use very efficiently I think the Commerce Department which oversees that needs to identify more spectrum to get into the market so that we can have real competition for broadband over uh, the spectrum over wireless services and there's other areas we need to involve as well. The Department of Agriculture has a rural utility service that has loans and grants to underserved rural areas. There's the need for computers for children at home. There's a need for tax credits and for depreciation rules that encourage the deployment of broadband networks. And of course, we have to have math and science education. Even, even HUD gets into the game. You have to have broadband in housing developments. Why should we be building housing developments without fiber in them in this day and age? We want people in those public housing units to be able to have access to broadband as 
effective as anywhere else in the country. So these are the kind of things we need to focus on. Well, you spent 15 years up on Capitol Hill, seven with uh, majority, then Majority Leader Daschle's office. Uh, knowing what you know about Senator McCain, how would you see a McCain administration addressing some of the issues that the FCC is currently faced with? Well, I don't really want to, want to speculate on, on Senator McCain. I don't know. I've uh, always had a very good relationship with him. He's very thoughtful about these issues. He was chairman of the Commerce Committee for many years. I believe in general that uh, what we need is a national broadband policy. Uh, Senator Obama's campaign has laid out a very detailed one, so I can uh, talk about what he has proposed. I'm not sure exactly how that would differ. I would expect um, uh, that it would be a very different approach. And what we really need is a commitment on a national level, real leadership to get this done. You need to set goals, ambitious goals for broadband. I think uh, Senator Obama realizes that. You need to set benchmarks. You have to have deployment timetables. And you have to have measurable thresholds to gauge your progress. Is that less market, more government? Is that a too simplistic way of putting that? I think so, because it really is a partnership. It's working together. Um, corporations would love to have tax credits to build out broadband. Uh, Rural Utility Service provides loans and grants to make this happen. The question is, where do you put your resources? Do you put them into uh, tax cuts for very wealthy Americans that have done very well over the last eight years? Or do you focus on real need for broadband deployment to enhance our future economic growth and to make sure the people who've been left behind that have lower incomes that might live in rural areas have the opportunity to participate in this global economy. Otherwise, our whole country is going to fall behind. The basis for American economic leadership in the world has always been our technological excellence. Right now, we're seeing that fall behind. We're seeing the United States 15th by some measures in broadband. And even worse, we, we pay more in America for less bandwidth. We pay more for slower connections on broadband than most other uh, major countries with which we're competing. If we don't turn this around, we're going to see our jobs going over these broadband pipes overseas while we lose jobs, high-tech, high-paying jobs right here in the United States. That's completely unacceptable. It takes a real national commitment, a commitment from the White House on down, which we haven't seen in recent years, to make that happen. Uh, let's say there is a Democrat in November 08 elected, Senator Obama. Uh, would you like to be chairman of the FCC? Oh, I, you know, it's really not at all a question for me. It's up to uh, whoever would be elected, and, and uh, so I, I have no idea. Well, if we could, uh, Commissioner Adelstein, let's talk about some of the uh, management issues that are facing the FCC currently. There's been a lot of criticism on Capitol Hill. There's been criticism from fellow commissioners of uh, Kevin Martin's management practices at the FCC. How would you uh, describe his management practices? Well, there's been a lot of concerns with the processes at the FCC, how we've conducted our business, and the management practices, according to um, members of Congress who oversee the FCC, potentially are affecting our ability to discharge our duties. There's a laundry list of areas that Congress has raised of concerns, from the studies that we did in the media ownership process to the kind of public notice that we've given to the public. Um, I don't know the specifics of the investigation, but uh, what Congress really wants is an open and transparent process. They want to know that the FCC is being fair. They want to know that uh, business as usual is not good enough, that somehow we are putting in processes that are fair to the public. They get adequate input. They get adequate notice of things. We have the ability to uh, be objective and fair. After all, the FCC is supposed to be the expert agency. We're not supposed to be a political agency. We're supposed to decide things based on real studies based on properly peer-reviewed studies. Uh, we need to, draw, need to draw on our outstanding expert staff. We have a fantastic staff at the FCC that we really need to take uh, full advantage of. I think uh, for us to restore our, ourselves as the independent expert agency that Congress intended is what the purpose of the investigation is. Are some of the uh, rules about FCC meetings uh, outdated and uh, cantankerous when you're trying to get a meeting scheduled? Well, we have good relationships with each other. I get along very well with every one of my colleagues, and, and we're friends. Uh, you know, it, it, the reason sometimes meetings start late is we're negotiating at the last minute. It might be some stylistic issues as far as how things are scheduled and managed. Uh, I think it could be managed better. We've certainly done a lot of complicated things in the years I was on the FCC before and in all previous years where we were able to get our work done and start meetings on time. Uh, that being said, I don't think it's particularly cantankerous. It's just... You know, these are big issues and they're complicated, difficult, and we need to get them right. 
last week on The Communicators, John Shimkus was our guest. He is a Republican from Arizona and a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, he talked about the proposed investigation of the FCC that uh, uh, Energy and Commerce Chairman John Dingell has asked for. Here's what he had to say. So the FCC is a, a, has a lot of things on its plate. Uh, they have rules when they go into formal session. There's really not rules in the other parts when they prepare to go to uh, session. So this is kind of a look at that whole process and should there be more formalized rules prior to um, and the like. It, I, I think it'll amount to, I don't think it'll amount to a lot. Commissioner Adelstein. Well, I think what uh, Congressman Shimkus is saying is that they want a deliberative and consensus type process at the FCC. They'd like to know that the processes are put in place that will be fair to everybody involved. There's a lot at stake in what we do at the FCC. We oversee the media. We oversee all of the wireline communications, cable, telephone, all of the wireless communications from your cell phone to satellites uh, to your, your garage door opener. And there, there's a lot at stake. There's a lot of money at stake. And the process has to be one that's fair, that's open, that's transparent, that the public feels that it was really done by an expert agency without an agenda. And that's what I think we're all shooting for. Uh, in a recent speech, you talked about children's programming, and I want to ask you to expand on this. We at the Federal Communications Commission also need to play a more effective and productive role in working with you to help parents insulate their children not only from indecent and profane programming, but also violent and unhealthful content. Are you asking for regulation of children's programming? What I'm concerned about is that families like mine, I have some small children at home, are just swimming in a sea of material that we consider inappropriate for our children. Now, there's sexual, there's violent, there's commercial activity where they're trying to sell us all kinds of material we might not want. Uh, there's unhealthy products that are just inundating us across all these different platforms, across the television, the cable, satellite, broadband, uh, video games. And parents are, frankly, getting pretty fed up, like myself, when it's so easy to stumble into something that you find inappropriate for your kids. I compare it to a game of whack-a-mole, where you're trying to whack these moles, but they're coming up faster, and they're proliferating. There's more of them. So we're having a hard time keeping up as parents. What I want to do is give parents tools to be able to deal with that, tools that are simple, that are easy to use, and that can be used across platforms for parents to control what is getting into their children's minds and not having all these marketers who can prey on kids' minds that are thinking five steps ahead about how can I manipulate this child to make their parent go buy something that their parent doesn't want them to buy. Or so that they're trying to sell something to uh, older people that might be violent, inappropriate for children. What can the parent do to make it easy? A lot of parents don't know about the parental controls that are available to them, and they're different. There's a V-chip. Few people know about it. People that use it like it. But we have to make that work better for parents. And let's make that consistent with the controls that are available on the cable systems and the satellite systems. And TiVo has a great parental control system. Why can't we, instead of having all these complicated deals, and if you're a parent, you know what I mean, or you have to go through the menu and figure out how you do it and what all these ratings mean and the ratings need to be clear. Well, why can't we do for parental controls what uh, Apple did for the, for the wireless phone, the iPhone? Let's make it as simple as an iPhone, as intuitive as an iPhone. So you just push a button and then you can instantly, for example, cut off a program. If it's inappropriate, you push a button, it's gone. Kids can't watch it. You push another button and get rid of violent material and then you push it easily again, it, it, it comes off. Some people are concerned about violence, some people are concerned about sex, some people about uh, selling of products that are inappropriate to their kids. Let's make it easy for parents. Let's have the technology that's making it right now so difficult, but also that provides such a wealth of opportunities, something that works for parents. What, what about something like the family hour that the Parents Television Council is called for? I think it's a great idea if we could restore that. There might be a need for Congress to pass an antitrust exemption so that these different, uh, tele different networks can work together to try to arrange something that would work across the board. Uh, there was concerns about that in the past, but I think that kind of thing makes a lot of sense, and it makes families feel like there's a safe place. And something that has to be a part of that is commercials. I talk to a lot of my friends who have kids like me, and in the middle of a show that might be family-friendly, it might be sports programming or American Idol or something that 
they feel comfortable watching with their family, a commercial will come on for a Cialis or for beer or for a violent show that all of a sudden something comes on the screen that is much more violent than you would want your child exposed to. What is happening here? I mean, why is it that the standards and practices aren't better by these companies, that they're allowing their viewers to be exposed to things that they don't want their kids exposed to? If that's the way it's going to be, we need to rate commercials so that if a violent commercial comes on in the middle of a program that gets through the screen, then it will go off too. Maybe that will hold their feet to the fire as well. Is that a First Amendment issue? No, because it's a rating. Remember, we're not regulating it. We're not saying they can't do it. We're saying that a parent has a right to control it. The Supreme Court has, has held that we are allowed to use the least restrictive means, and that means parental controls are completely acceptable under the First Amendment. Now, how far we can go to mandate it is a question which I think First Amendment scholars can debate. I think the ideal way to do this is in a cooperative arrangement with broadcasters, cable companies, satellite operators, and programmers, and the developers of this content. Because, frankly, the FCC's role is somewhat limited. We have legislative authority over the V-chip, but when we get into some of these other cable systems and uh, the, the pay systems, we don't have that kind of authority. So we need to build on the V-chip. We need to make the V-chip simple so people are getting, that are getting their television over the air can understand the ratings and come up with that same uniform, simple, and clear rating system across all of these different channels so that when we do public education campaigns, which are desperately needed to educate parents, and the industry is already stepping up. The industry is doing a lot. You've seen some of these ads probably on TV for it. But it, it isn't always thinking through. And, and there's so many different systems that parents can't be educated simply about what the ratings mean. So if we can be uniform about it, then it's going to be easier for these public education campaigns to break through and help parents control what's getting into their children's minds. This is The Communicators. Jonathan Adelstein is our guest. He's one of two Democratic commissioners on the FCC. Uh, speaking of public education uh, campaigns, how would you rate cable and broadcast in their campaign during the digital transition? Well, I think the cable and broadcast industries have really stepped up to the plate to educate people about the digital television transition. And just to explain that, right now we're about ready to go under a huge transformation of television, which is going from the old analog age to digital, which means that all these broadcasters are going to switch over on February 18th of 2009 to a new system of digital television, which will allow them to provide more channels, and they're going to look better, they're going to sound better, clearer picture. But the problem is a lot of televisions in America are these old analog TVs, and they're not ready. Now, the cable companies and the broadcasters have been doing a lot of work on this, but frankly, I think the government has fallen behind. We're not doing everything we can. The Government Accountability Office has said that there's nobody in charge and there's no plan. And this was months ago, and we still don't have a plan, and nobody's in charge. Now, Congress has prodded us to do a better job. I think Congress is deeply concerned about this. You know, I've called for having an interagency task force so that we can coordinate across the many different government agencies that are involved, that hasn't been done. Fortunately, my uh, call for a DTV task force within the FCC has been heated, and it's doing a lot of good work preparing for this. But I think we're really going to be a little overwhelmed unless we do more. I mean, uh, our own chairman, Chairman uh, Inouye in the Senate and Chairman Dingell in the House, have called for a federal task force that goes across agencies. I don't understand why a simple stuff like that can't be done. Uh, you have called for more Wilmingtons, more test markets, um, and also uh, turnoffs, um, brief turnoffs of analog TV so people can get used to this. Um, where should these other test markets be and why should there be more? What I think we should do is have broadcasters voluntarily, in cooperation with the FCC, begin doing little experiments where they turn off the analog signal for a little while and show viewers what it will be like and give viewers an opportunity to see if their digital equipment is up to snuff as well. I think we could do that in certain cities across the country where the broadcasters are ready, willing, and able to do it. It's already being done in some communities like uh, Orlando and, and Houston. We could build from these local efforts to region-wide efforts, perhaps. And then maybe we could do a national soft cutoff, I call it, because it wouldn't cut off all of the signals at once, but just those uh, that are, that are uh, in certain areas, and then it would only be for a limited period of time. But we could do a nationwide soft cutoff, maybe a month out from the transition, so everybody can get a little test run and say, here's what's going to happen. And during that time, there can be something on the screen still being broadcast in analog to explain what's going on. And you can see if you can get the digital signal, then you won't have to worry about it. 
great opportunity for educating people, great opportunity for getting the word out, and a great opportunity for preparing everybody for what's going to come. Uh, will you be in Wilmington in September for the, uh, the test, and what kind of FCC personnel are down there now? We are putting a lot of people down in Wilmington. We have uh, four or five people down there full time between now and then. I'm, I'm a little concerned we're putting so many resources in there. It may not be an accurate test, but we'll, we'll see. It's sort of the observer effect where if you put too much attention on something. On the other hand, I should explain, Wilmington is one community in North Carolina that agreed to cut off the signals early to make sure that uh, we knew what we could learn from one community cutting it off. And I think there's a lot to be learned by doing that. It's a, it's a great idea. And that's why we need more of them. Only one community in the whole country was prepared to do it. It's the 134th largest market out of 210, so it's a pretty small market. It's all flat. We need other experiments to happen as well. Because people aren't ready to do a full cutoff, Wilmington is going to cut off everything. It's going to be over. The digital transition for people in Wilmington is going to happen in September, not in February, if you're watching in Wilmington. But everywhere else, it's going to happen in February of 2009. So we'll learn the experience of Wilmington, take those lessons and apply them, and hopefully they'll be, they'll be valid ones. Is it too late to be calling for other tests right now? Well, it looks like we're not going to get any other community stepping up to the plate. What we are going to have is broadcasters willing to do these soft cutoffs. I've spoken to the broadcasters about it, and they seem very interested in the idea of doing a test, just a short-term test, not cutting off for good and switching over to digital, but just doing it for a short period of time, be it a half an hour or even five minutes or an hour, whatever it takes to get the message across that this is what's coming. They seem willing to do, and maybe we can build that if we work together with them in a partnership to do a national soft cutoff. Uh, Jonathan Adelstein, some media ownership issues. Here's an sure. XM Sirius merger that right. was proposed in March of 2007. Still has not been approved. June 30th is the uh, supposed date for that. Is that still going to happen? I think it will happen pretty soon that we're going to get the opportunity to uh, judge that merger. We, we still haven't received anything from uh, the chairman. Normally the chairman puts an item before us. Right now the idea of a merger violates our rules, so there has to be two steps the FCC has to take. First of all, we have to change our current rules, which say it's prohibited for one company to own uh, both of those satellite networks. And then we have to decide what to do about the merger and whether there are any specific conditions that need to be placed on it. I expect that will happen pretty shortly. And will you vote in favor of that merger? Well, I haven't seen what the proposal is yet, so I can't really say because the chairman hasn't put before us his proposal to deal with the real concerns that the merger raises. And you've spoken out very, uh, very heavily against uh, some cross-ownership issues, TV and newspaper in the same towns. Well, I think so. I think that media consolidation in this country has done a great disservice to our democracy. You're seeing a real concentration which has led to the snuffing out of a lot of local owners. We've seen less local news when a national company overtakes and buys up local outlets. You're seeing uh, homogenization of the news and, and really in, in terms of all programming something of a race to the bottom as these large nationally consolidated companies buy up more and more of the media landscape People talk about there being 300 channels on and there's a lot of different choice, but in fact, the vast bulk of what people are, are seeing and hearing over the airwaves are controlled by just a handful of the most powerful companies. And they're controlled by shareholders. After all, they're beholden to the bottom line, and, and that's what they have to do. But the government needs to make sure that the public gets something out of the bargain as well. After all, these companies are using the public airwaves, and we need to ensure that they are adhering to public interest obligations. We are traditionally been looking at over the years since 1934 that the FCC was created. Is there uh, diversity, competition, and localism? I don't see how allowing uh, big media companies to get even bigger contributes to any of those objectives. Another potential merger, Verizon and Altel. What are some of the issues that the FCC has to consider? Well, we just got that one in, and so the Department of Justice generally looks at these first, and they'll see whether or not there's uh, overlapping markets where there's excessive concentration and make their recommendations, and we'll uh, look at what the Justice Department does and make our own determination along those lines as well. Going back to the media, you, I believe I'm quoting you correctly when I say that you said, do not let what happened to the media happen to the Internet. What did you mean by that? What I meant was that we don't want a handful of corporate giants basically controlling the Internet. 
Right now, there are a very small number of very large companies that control Internet access, the cable companies and the phone companies. We don't want them to become gatekeepers like they are over video to control what people see or hear and what can flow over the Internet, particularly if they're trying to control content in ways that uh, stops competing applications from going over their systems. For example, it's unacceptable for phone companies to try to stop competing phone service that would be an internet phone service or for a cable company to try to stop video that would compete with its underlying video service. That would be uh, discriminatory and that would be unreasonable, I think, for anti-competitive purposes to control what can go over the internet. The beauty of the internet is it's open, it's neutral, nobody's in charge and everybody's in charge. That's the way it's worked well, that's the way it should work. All we're saying is let's keep the internet freedom alive. Let's make sure that the freedom that has been the source of great innovation and so much technological progress to remain no matter uh, who is providing the internet access. Do you think that if Senator McCain or Senator Obama, whichever one is elected president, net neutrality will become an issue after the 08 election? Well, I think it's already been discussed by the campaigns. I think certainly that the idea of internet freedom is one that is very important. I mean, not to get into the issues of that campaign, but I mean, Senator Obama has used the internet like has never been seen before to organize, to uh, involve people in the political process, to reinvigorate American democracy. And they've spoken, and he's spoken about the need to get the processes like that in place in government, to open up the federal government. And certainly places like the FCC need to be more open. We need to be holding town hall forums over broadband. We need to be getting out to the public. As I've advocated for media ownership rules and for net neutrality, we've gotten out now and spoken to the American people about it. They have a real stake in this issue. Let's open up our government using technology for those purposes as well, and let's make sure that that freedom that will help government and businesses alike remains the hallmark of the Internet. What about metered usage of broadband? Well, they've talked about it, and some companies are now discussing paying uh, by the amount that you use. Traditionally, in utilities regulation, that's been acceptable. You think about a uh, water bill or an electrical bill, it's based on how much you use. That's not discriminatory. That doesn't say you can't use this application or that application. It just says the more you use, the more you pay. Uh, we need to see how that works in practice, and if it's a truly competitive market, there wouldn't be any concerns. Who are some of the more effective lobbying groups here in Washington when it comes to the FCC? Well, there's a lot of them. You know, the companies that we've traditionally overseen for many years are incredibly effective. We have a big, powerful media companies, telecom companies, uh, cable companies that are born and raised, some of them, going back to the very founding of the FCC and have always worked with the FCC to get what they need. Sometimes the agency is actually accused of being captured sometimes by the very industries that we oversee. But these are effective agencies. Our real mission is to serve the public interest. The act that we oversee talks about the public interest 112 times. So we need to listen to everybody that comes in and makes their case. I always like to give uh, time also to the public interest advocates, which are a smaller, hardy band of folks that really fight and scrap their way into the FCC. Organizations like Free Press or the Media Access Project, uh, Center for Media Democracy, there's too many to list. They do a great job. When it comes to children, you have Common Sense Media and Children Now. There are public interest organizations that do a great job. Consumers Union was testifying before us yesterday and made some great testimony about early termination fees and how phone companies, uh, or especially the cellular phone companies, are handling consumers who try to get out of their service early and what's fair and what's not fair. So we listen to the big telecom companies. We listen to the public interest groups. I think uh, there are a lot of effective folks. I'm, I'm heavily lobbied, let me put it that way. Are there too many lobbyists? Well, there's no such thing. I mean, there, you know, there's no such thing as getting too much information. This is a country that is built on the right to petition the government for grievances. So I can't complain about the fact that we're inundated. It's their job. And it's our job to wade through the competing arguments and try to find out what's in the public interest, not what's in the interest of the companies that we oversee. And finally, Commissioner Adelstein, uh, speak, there was a recent issue about military analysts and the media, and you have called for an investigation. I commit to you that I plan to demand a real and thorough investigation. We need to determine without delay whether the DOD violated the laws we enforce against Paola. What is the status of that investigation? Well, there's an investigation undergoing right now 
because a number of members of Congress have called for it, including uh, Senator Obama, Senator Clinton, uh, Chairman Dingell in the House. We are now looking into the question of whether the Department of Defense, in establishing a program that organized and sometimes paid 75 military analysts to echo uh, the administration's foreign policy viewpoints, were in fact uh, given access to information from the administration if they were towing the line in terms of what they were putting out over the airwaves, but if they weren't, they were cut off from that access. The question is, was that access valuable? These were companies who are, com these are individuals, often military veterans, who have their own consulting firms or their own companies that uh, do business before the private sector but also rely on government contracts. Was that access something of value to them that they, in exchange for getting that access, were willing to put certain things out over the airwaves. People think about payola traditionally as somebody from a record company paying a radio station to put their record on the air. It's the same concept here. Was somebody basically being paid off by the government in order to put out a certain message over the air? There's nothing uh, wrong with that inherently under the FCC rules, but it's required to be disclosed. You have to say that this was brought to you by the Department of Defense so that the public has the ability to make up its own mind about the information that was presented. There's one other federal law that's involved here as well, which is our anti-propaganda law. There's no federal funds are allowed to be used for covert propaganda. And the GAO has seen that as the public right to know is based on whether or not there was an attempt to hide the source or whether attribution was made as to who is the source of backing for that particular message. That's not overseen by the FCC, but by the Department of Justice, and I've called for the Department of Justice to investigate that as well. Jonathan Edelstein is one of two Democratic members of the Federal Communications Commission. Thank you for being on The Communicators. Well, thanks for having me.